Okay, for some reason, I'm seeing Matthew on my screen. Does everybody else see Matthew on their screen? Uh, I don't. Do you see me? Yes. Okay, that is as it should be, right? Okay, let's um, let's go ahead and talk about the homework. I, I, I mentioned to you that we were all going to uh, look at the homework, and that was the that was the unfinished problem. This was the problem that established probability theory in the 17th century, pioneered by um, my hero Blaise Pascal and the other and another great French mathematician Fermat. I wonder if in French it's Fermat. They don't finish their T's there, do they? Anybody know? Fermat? Yeah, I don't know either. So. Um, let me let me pick someone out now in terms of a random number generator i do have a random number generator which i did not prepare but i can i can do this very quickly and my random number generator is the flipping of coins and uh today they're going to be two pennies from 1974 and 2001 how many were born after 1974? Okay, wow, okay, I'm getting old. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Um, try to remember your numbers so I don't have to assign them every time. Uh, Justin, you're going to be, and don't take this offensively, you are going to be number zero, zero, okay? <laughs> so if we get a zero, zero, that's what we'll do. Uh, Theo, you will be zero, 01. Glauco is two. And Adam is three. Matthew, you will be four. And Matthew, you've screwed up our whole random number selection because now with four, I can only flip two coins because I generate the number in a binary sense. And now I'm going to have to flip three coins, which is okay. Which is okay. So does anybody not want to do this? Or did everybody get the answer? What did you think about the answer? Was was it was it as difficult as you thought? No, it, it was kind of straightforward. Okay, zero one. That's that Theo. Okay, mm -hmm. share share your screen and put your work up and kind of walk us through it. And by the way, I have to give you permission, so let me go ahead and do that. Okay, you are permitted right now. Okay, here we go. You guys should see one of my computer screens. I nice. see, we see clouds. Okay. That's actually by my house. All right, here we go. So, um, oh my gosh, you use LaTeX, it looks like. I did, only because I had a template um, already. So, there are two players, A and B, who are flipping a coin five times. The best out of the five coin flips wins the money pot which is $5,000. Player A has won two coin flips and player B has won one coin flip when both suddenly pass from this world to the next. How should the $5,000 be divided amongst their estates? Um, so I kind of, uh, I, would you like me to read this or just? Uh, just I, I just kind of, I, I would prefer a narrative, a non-reading narrative. That sounds and, and good. Point, to pointing to things when you need to point to things. Okay. And if, there, and if there is something important, just outline it so we can all see where you're reading from. Okay. So uh, I would say the 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 way I was thinking about it was you want to divide up the sum uh, or the money according to the probability that each player would have had that they would win the game. So uh, if, for instance, if everything was tied. You would divide it half and half but in this case uh there are two remaining coin flips that need to happen and in three out of the three out of the four possible outcomes player a who has already won two coin flips um wins everything and then there's only one uh one of the outcomes out of the four total outcomes uh that would have um, player B winning. I'm sorry, this A here should actually be a B. Um, and so what I suggested or what I propose is that player A's estate be given 
75% uh, of the $5,000, which is $3,750, and player B's estate be given the rest. Um, so we're dividing it up according to the probability that each person would have won the entire money pot. Okay, um, let's take a vote. How many think Theo is right? Okay, well, Theo, looks like you win. That's, of course, how we determine all mathematical truth is by majority vote. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's perfect. Now, how did you get the probability of winning, or let's see, um, probability of B winning, your equation four? Uh, let's see, yeah. I forget which one won what. No, the probability of A winning. How did, how did you get the probability of A winning? So probability of A winning, you need three... Um, coin flips to win uh, the, the game. And uh, there are four possible outcomes, just like we flipped coins a minute ago. Um, you could uh, have tails both times, or you could have head, tail, tail, head, and, and tail, tail. Um, and so basically- So you looked, you looked at the combination of all four possible outputs or future correct. events. And then you counted the number of ones, the number of outcomes that would have let A win. That's correct. Okay. So, yeah, and that's the way that Pascal and Fermat did it. Yeah, very good. Very good. They, uh, they, they, they actually use this um, classic definition that we've talked about previously. They looked at the total number of wins, and that was the that was the numerator and then the total number of outcomes that was a denominator and that was how they decided to um to to divide the pot so this <laughs> is incredibly so easy to us but to them the idea of a probability in something in the future was very very different and so this was the genesis of the forming of probability okay thank you thank you very much okay let's see I have a chat over here. How do I close my chat? There, I hit close. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, for, for next time, uh, you will see a couple of problems, which I will assign during the lecture, and you can, you can see them as we begin to talk. So with that, let me go ahead and share my screen, and we will continue with our kind of review of probability, which I want to go through fast. I have a tendency to not go through fast, but... Uh, but I do my best to go fast. Okay. So here we go. This is what we ended up last time with, right? This was the uh, unfinished game and that I gave you as a, as a homework assignment. So let's go on to the next thing. If you remember, we're talking about the classical definition of probability, which is to apply something, by the way, called Bernoulli's principle of insufficient reason. Uh, which is very interesting. He says that if you have no idea about the outcomes of something, then you should assign them all equally probable. And there is the assumption here in the solution of the unfinished problem that is indeed like that. I'll elaborate on that later. Oh, I guess that was the last slide in that, uh, that history. So therefore, I'm going to close this and try to open the next one. Let's see. Nope, that's the unfinished game. I will literally close that and try this one. And I think this is the next one. Okay, good. This continues our review of probability and, um, and random variables. And we're going through the definitions. <clears throat> Uh, we went through the classical definition. No, we went through this already. No, I guess we didn't. Oh, I remember we got up through Bertrand's paradox. That's what it was. That's where we ended. Bertrand's paradox, not the unfinished game. So let's go on with another one. This one is uh, the Monty Hall problem. I think that this is so popular these days that maybe some of you have heard about this. There used to be a game show. I think it's still on with a different host, but it was hosted by this guy named Monty Hall, who's pictured here. And he used to give away people and play with their minds a little bit. But here's, here, here's the Monty Hall problem. The Monty Hall problem is you have three curtains. Behind one of the curtains is a million dollars. 
Behind the other two curtains are, I think I have pictured here, lava lamps, if you know what a la lava lamp is. And what you'd like to do is you would like to choose the curtain that has the million dollars behind it, right? And the question is probabilistically, what is the best way, what is the best way to choose the curtain? And here's what happens. Monty Hall says, I got these three curtains. Everything is equally probable. Bernoulli's principle of insufficient reason again. Everything is equally probable if you don't know anything else that's going on. So they're all three uh, equally probable. And Monty Hall says, choose a curtain. Now you don't know what's behind the curtain. You don't know what's behind the curtain. You say it's like curtain two. And Monty Hall knows what's behind all the curtains. Is that okay? He knows what's behind all of the curtains. And he will ask you, okay, I'm not gonna show you what's behind curtain number two, but what I am going to do is I'm gonna show, going to show you a lava lamp. So no matter what curtain you show, choose, there's at least one lava lamp there, right? So he's gonna open one of the doors and he's gonna show you a lava lamp. Now, the question is, what do you do? He opens curtain number three and he shows you a lava lamp. Remember, you've chosen curtain number two and um, and he doesn't show you that, but he, he opens curtain number three and there's a lava lamp. What do you do? Do you stay with the curtain that you chose initially or do you change the curtain to curtain number one? Change the curtain. What's that? Change the curtain. Yeah, have you heard about this before, or is that your intuition talking? Yeah, and then you're like, when you first select, you have three different possibilities. You have a 33% chance of winning the money, but if after they show you a curtain and you switch it, then you're down to two chances. Then um, switching it based on those two will give you a 50% chance for winning. Yeah, and you're actually two thirds of a chance. I, th I think. Well, I think. I, I think. I forget the solution, but it does improve yeah. if you switch it. Now yeah. this this problem was initially um, initially reported by a columnist in a weekly newspaper that always came with the Sunday paper. I think it's called the Weekly or something like that. And her name, if I recall right, was uh, Von Savant, and she was purported to have the highest IQ in the world. And she gave the solution that you always need to switch the curtains. Now, most people, including myself, when they looked at this, think that, hey, you know, it doesn't matter. It's still a 50-50 proposition. But indeed, it's wrong. And I am in good company. They're one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century. Paul Erdos wrote in and said, nope, it doesn't make a difference. So Erdos actually had it wrong. But the probability is that if you do change the curtain, your chances of winning are improved. So here's the problem. There are three doors behind each is the sum of money. Each has a different amount of money. That's all you know. You choose the doors to be open. The first door is open. You look at the result and decide whether to open the other door. Um, okay, so no, 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 no. Nope, that's the wrong one. Okay, so one of the homework assignments I would like you to do is I would like to sh you to show that the probability increases if you switch from your initial from your initial choice. So in the homework assignment, it says is show the Monty Hall problem or prove the Monty Hall problem. And I would like you to find out what the probability is if you stay with your initial solution or if you go. The solution is very akin to the to the problem to the unfinished game problem. You'll find out. And here's another one. This is Monty Hall problem number two, but I, I've redone it and I've renamed it here. It's called Deal or No Deal. Anybody watch the show Deal or No Deal, the game show? to have you Adam it's really engaging and if you want to kind of get a quick course in probability and how you should bet in Vegas is probably a good show to watch but here's the deal or no deal problem you have three cards uh, this is from three card Monty but that's that's different let's assume you have three cards on these three cards are written amounts of money now the amount of money 
that is in the card that that is on the cards is what you can win but you have no idea about the amount of money it could be a penny it could be a billion trillion zillion dollars it could be anything you have no idea of what is what what is on the cards and here's the idea you turn over a card and you have the choice you can keep what is on the card or you can choose another card now, if you choose another card, you lose what was on the first card. You lose what was on the first card, but you turn the second card and then you have another possibility to keep that amount of money or to switch to the third card. Now, if the first card was turned over and it was a billion dollars, I would say, I don't care what the other cards are, I'm gonna take it, right? But here's the rule, here's the rub. You have to choose the card with the most money on it in order to win. So if you turn over a card and there's a billion dollars on it, another card has $2 billion, you don't get to keep that billion dollars. It has to be the largest of the three. Do you understand the problem? How many cards that you flip the one over and then you're allowed to flip over one other card? No, you, okay, what, what happens if you've watched the show, you flip over one card and the guy that's doing the dealing says, deal or no deal. You either take the card or you can abandon the card and flip over another card. And then once you look at the second card, you can abandon that card or you can keep it and if you abandon that card, you get to flip over the third card. Okay. And if you flip over the third card, that's that's your final that's your your final uh, result. But you only win if the card that you flip over has the most amount of all three cards. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on that? That's the deal or no deal. It's a variation on the game show that. Adam and I have watched. I would like you to come up with a solution for the deal or no deal problem. And that's one of the assignments. Here is a, th any questions on that at all? Okay, I want you to find out the optimal strategy and your probability of winning if you apply your optimal strategy. Now, here's, here, here's another question I would like you to, to answer, which I'm going to include on the homework, is I think a fascinating, a fascinating uh, question. There is, was a little boy in Russia and he was riding along with his parents and the, uh, and the radio was blaring. And all of a sudden, the, the announcer came on and said, here is a remarkable, incredible result from the United States of America. Of the first five, the, first of all, you should know that Independence Day in America was July 4th. And here is the remarkable result of the first five presidents and the first five presidents he actually named, he said it was uh, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. Those were the first five presidents. And he said, remarkably, three of these died on the 4th of July. Now, the little boy had no idea of the history of the United States. And making his decision only on what he heard he was 100% certain of the pres one of the presidents that died on, died on July 4th. Not all of the presidents, but he knew the identity of one, and he knew it immediately. I think that I might have presented this before. Adam, if I, if, if I told you this? Yeah, I think we talked about it in Info Theory. Okay, so therefore, uh, this, this will be easy for Adam and maybe Glauco, but I'd like you other guys to figure out how that little boy knew. Now, it wasn't a probability of three out of five. That boy was 100% certain that uh, of the identity of one of the presidents that had died on the 4th of July.
I will give you a hint. We're talking about probability, and this really shows you that minds get stuck in a rut. You're thinking about probabilities and the probability of three out of five. Um, unfortunately, when you go to school and you begin to do things, your mind gets deeper and deeper into ruts. And the older you get, the deeper your mind gets into a rut. You, you, you base all of your thinking on experiences of previous paradigms and have a difficult time of thinking outside of the box. This is a thinking outside of the box idea. In fact, there's something called the Fields Medal. And we mentioned the Fields Medal in the first lecture, but it's awarded every four years to somebody under the age, I believe, of 40 years old. And this is really interesting because most of the great discoveries come from young people. They come from people of your age. When Einstein published his four incredible papers, I think it was 1904, he had four incredible papers. He published the photoelectric effect, which won him a Nobel Prize. He published a paper establishing Brownian motion, uh, that, that indeed that uh, when you put a little sheet of a little piece of paper in a, a fluid, that you see it kind of bouncing around randomly. He proved the uh, general, uh, the specific theory of relativity, and then he also proposed the paper that had the most famous equation of all time in it, e is equal to mc squared. He did this in his 20s. And if you look back at people like Newton and uh, other great people, they do it when they are young and their minds are not entrenched in a, um, in a rut. That's the reason when I work with graduate students, sometimes I hear them propose stupid things, but I always say, I want to hear more. And I really have to listen to it before I think it's really stupid. And if it is stupid, finally, I say, okay. But many times they will come up with insights, thinking outside of my experience with this God-given ability of creativity to come up with solutions which are enormous. So the hint to the solution to this problem is that the solution has nothing to do with probability. So this is a challenge to you to think outside of the box. And by the way, I've asked this. I asked this to a missionary in Japan. He got it right away. He knew exactly what the answer was. But every time I've asked it to an engineer, a scientist, or a mathematician, they, they kind of uh, they think about it, and they have a rough time. But people outside of our field many times get this solution right away. OK, any question on that? Theo, the, the, Theo, Justin, Matthew, maybe we, maybe we can skip this. Do either do any of you know? And you have to you have to be honest that you haven't heard the solution before. Do any, either of you, any of you know uh, the solution to this problem? Mm -hmm. No. Nice, Adam. Okay. No, I I missed the um, first part when you were explaining it because I was writing down something. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Having multitask problems, huh, Justin? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, yeah, the idea is the little boy was riding in the car he heard over the radio without any information about American history that Independence Day in the United States was July 4th. And he heard, it, and the announcer says, this is an incredible, astonishing result. But of the first five presidents, four of them died on July 4th. The first five presidents were Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. The little boy knew immediately, just from what he listened to on the radio, the identity of one of those presidents that died, that died on July 4th. Okay, so you guys think about that and see if you can get this. I'm not, I'm not going to uh, do any credit for this, but I really want you to think about it and see if you can uh, think outside of the box, outside of probability, not a probability of three out of five, but uh, total certainty of the identity and see if you can, you, you can tie down that president. Okay, that makes sense to everybody? Okay. And it shows the solution to all of life's problems does not lie with technology, mathematics, and materialism. Okay, that's the deal or no deal problem. Now, we've just talked about the classic definition, the classic definition of probability, where you take the total number of outcomes as the denominator and, 
and the numerator, you put the total number of successes, and that ratio is the probability, like throwing a dime. There's another, there's another way to do it, which is called a relative frequency definition. People who are worshipers of this procedure are sometimes called frequentists, and they are interested in empirical evidence. And uh, one of the classic ones is Monte Carlo simulation. And this is just an experimental verification of, or a, a, I'm sorry, a statistical estimation of what the probability is. One of the problems that I posed with you last time was what is the probability of you landing on free parking after 10 turns in Monopoly? You have 10 terms of Monopoly. What's the chance of you landing on free parking? I don't know how to calculate that. I don't know how many times out of, you know, you know, 10 turns is possible to land on free parking. We're including all this other stuff. Like if you roll doubles, you get another roll and stuff. So it just becomes too complex a problem to analyze. So another way to do it is to go to the computer, write a program simulating Monopoly and do, I don't know, a half million, a million, two million um, random implementations of the monopoly problem for 10 terms and see how many times that you land on free parking. Then the ratio of the times that you landed on free parking divided by the total number of terms you get is an estimate. It isn't exactly the same, but it's an estimate. You could use the relative frequency thing in rolling a die, of course. You want to find out what the probability of getting three pips are. You could roll the die a million times and see how many times three pips came up. And it would be approximately one sixth. It wouldn't be exactly, but it'd be approximately that. So that's the idea of a Monte Carlo simulation. Here, here's, a, here's an interesting problem, and this is estimating pi by throwing darts. <laughs> Are you ready? We have, a, we have a wall in which there's a bunch of circles. Do you see all these circles? And these circles are just touching each other. And those those circles are so small that when you throw the dart, you have no control whether it's going to go inside a circle or outside a circle. Is that okay? So we can say that we're basically choosing a random point somewhere within this uh, uh, sequence of circles. Now, what is the probability of getting it inside of a circle? Well, if we look at the area, if we look at a single cell of this, which is at the bottom right, and we take the area of the circle divided by the area of the square, that's going to be the probability that if you choose a random point in the square, that that point will be in the circle, right? So therefore, the probability is going to be the area of the, of the circle. That's all of your successes divided by the area of the squares, which is pi over 4. So if you apply this relative frequency approach to estimating probability, you can throw a billion darts at this board, take your total number of successes, divide them by, divide it by the total number of your dart throws and estimate pi. That's interesting, right? Let's look at another one, which is a little bit more subtle. This is something called Buffin's needle. Uh, Buffon was a member of the court, and I guess the French court, because he was French, and he used to astonish the other people at the court by uh, figuring out the probability that on the court, on the court floor, which apparently, the, at least this is the, this is the myth, I don't know the degree of truth in it, but there was, there was a number of, um, there was a number of lines and what he would do is he would drop a needle and he, he, he was able to figure out that the probability that that needle landing at an arbitrary interval at an arbitrary angle, the probability that that needle crossed a point was related to pi. In fact, as you can see here on the left, if the spacing between the two lines is 2b and the length of the needle was 2a, then the probability of the needle crossing the line is 2a over pi b. It's not apparent. Where does the pi come from? I mean, there's no circles here like there was in the dart throwing contest. The pi comes in because there's an angle associated with that needle landing, right? 
you have to assume that the needle is uniformly distributed, that, or the angle of the needle is uniformly distributed, say, over zero to pi, correct? And you have to assume that the, um, that the middle of the needle is a random variable in x. And by doing that, you can go 2a over pi b. Um, I would like you to try to derive this. It turns out that to derive this, you need material that we haven't covered yet, which is multivariable, multi. Um, no, I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to retract that. We're going to wait until we prove this, until we get to the multi random variable. And then we will actually show that 2a over pi b is uh, the solution to this. So I'm not going to assign that. But here's the thing the Buffin used to do or purported to do. He would take like a thousand needles and he would drop them all on the floor. And then he would say, okay, if A was equal to B, if A was equal to B, the probability of a needle crossing a line is two over pi. I'm not sure what two over pi is. What is that, 0. 0.8 something or 0. 0.9? Probably 0. 0.8. Okay, here comes Adam to the rescue. A point six three six. Okay, po boy, man, I didn't do my divided bys very well. Point uh, point six three six. Okay, point six three six. And what he would say is, he said, after he dropped like a hundred needles or whatever, he says, "I bet you that the number of needles that crossed the line is about sixty three percent plus or minus." And he might give a little slop factor. And people were astonished. They went down, they counted all of the needles that crossed the line, and they said, wow, this is, uh, this is really, really, really uh, interesting that he got 0.63%. And the other interesting thing about this is that the probability involves pi. So Buffin could actually say if A is equal to B, the probability is 2 over A. So if you took that probability, reciprocated it, and multiplied by two, you'd have an estimate by pi, an estimate of pi. So therefore, Buffin could compute pi experimentally by throwing needles, much like we did at the dartboard. It's a much more subtle solution here. So that's Buffin's needle. It is something that we can evaluate by the classical approach. But we can also, just like anything in the classical approach, we can apply Monte Carlo simulation to a number of these uh, uh, experiments and estimate the probability. Monte Carlo, by the way, comes from the one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, another great mathematician, John von Neumann. Anybody ever heard of John von Neumann? Uh, what, what do you know about him, Theo? What did he do? Uh. I think we credit him with developing the what we call the von Neumann architecture, which is like yes. the computer structure of fetching instructions from memory and then processing on them and then storing things back into memory. Yes. In fact, sometimes those of us that were into uh, like neural networks used to call that the von Neumann bottleneck because you always had to go through a bottleneck to communicate between the two. Von Neumann uh, also did some other amazing stuff if you, if you had my course in alternating projections or multidimensional signal processing, uh, you'll know that von Neumann was, has his own algorithm, von Neumann's algorithm, which is a special case of pox. If you haven't had my course, you have no idea what that means. Um, another thing he did, and it's not recognized as much, the, the incredible paper of Kurt Gödel when he gave the paper and uh, Gödel was a little nerd from Vienna who came to a conference. He was in his 20s too, okay? He was another one. And he toppled a whole field of mathematics. And Gödel's theorem now has applications like in computing. Uh, people appeal to Gödel's theorem about limits of knowledge. Um, Stephen Hawking gave up his idea of pursuing the theory of everything because of Gödel's theorem. But Gödel's theorem, when he presented it at this conference, was very opaque. And it was only or, or it was largely the responsibility of John van Neumann, who was there and just a genius, recognizing it and, uh, and then popularizing Gödel's results so that people understood it. 
So that was another thing he did. One of the fascinating projects von Neumann did is he wanted to, uh, he wanted to go to Mars. And, uh, and one of the things they decided it would just take too much to send a lot of rocket ships to Mars. So what he thought, you know, what we could do is we could build this artificial intelligence and this artificial intelligence could go to Mars. And when they were at Mars, they could take some of the raw materials that were available, do things like build housing and build other robots that could do the duplication. And so Neumann, von Neumann was one of the, well, maybe the first one that uh, looked at that problem of robots having the capability of building similar identical robots. Um, so yeah, he was, he was really fascinating. He's also one of the founders of game theory. And when he was working on the Manhattan Project, the Manhattan Project was, of course, the U.S. rush to develop the atomic bomb during World War II. He came up with this technique of, of performing certain operations using this random application. And he's the one that coined the term, von, or not von Neumann simulation, he is the one that coined the, the term Monte Carlo simulations probably motivated by Monte Carlo in Mo Monaco, where they have a lot of gambling going on. So John von Neumann was the source of the, uh, was the source of the term Monte Carlo simulation. So we could do Monte Carlo simulation here. So this is something called Buffin's Needle. And then lastly, there, uh, there are probability models. And these are the ones that the mathematicians love. All great fields are started by a few obvious axioms. And these axioms are developed into lemmas and theorems and other things which can develop a field. And I, the first one to do it, anybody know the first one to do it historically? Develop something from axioms? You did a beautiful job of it too. Euclid. Euclid developed uh, all of planar geometry by some very simple axioms. So he was the first to propose this idea. Um, but here are the axioms of probability theory. In fact, I think they were, they were pioneered by a Russian mathematician named Kolmogorov. But the first one is, is you have some sort of universal set and A is a subset of that universal set. And the probability that A is, the probability of A must be greater than zero. So for every sub-event in the universal set, the probability of that event occurring was greater than zero. The other axiom was the probability of S, something happened in the universal set was equal to one. These are very obvious, right? Then he defined basically, um, he defined the idea of, uh, of, of the union. If A, now these are, these are, um, these are subsets, so you have, so you have this universal set S, and then you have some sort of, uh, some sort of subset A, and then uh, you have a subset B. So anyway, what, what the first axiom is the probability that you get something out of A is always gonna be greater than zero. The probability of getting something within the universal set is one. Uh, and then if you don't have an intersection, this is what this says, if A intersects B is equal to null set. In other words, if you have no intersection here, then the probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. You simply add the probabilities. Uh, then there is the, um, so that's one of them. Some people don't like this axiom and they go to axiom 3B instead of axiom 3A, but we won't worry about that. So, and we're not going to get mathy in here. We're not going to prove lemmas and things of that sort. We're going to go by our intuition and a bit of rigor. And that's what we're going to do. But this is the third definition. And if you talk to somebody in the mathematics department that pursues the area of probability, they will like their theories built from the axiomatic uh, foundation. Now, the different types of events, this is review for you. If A and B are independent, 
then the probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. Now, sometimes it's hard to get uh, dependence, independence, and mutually exclusive uh, confused. Independence is like a coin flip followed by another coin flip. The outcomes here are independent of each other. So if you get a heads or a tails here, it has nothing to do with the heads or tails here. So independence is related to repeated trials, typically, although the definition is not made that way. However, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit weird if you get down into the weeds. If we have three sets, say three sets A, B, and C, there has to be pairwise independence as we have here. So in other words, all three pairs must be independent of each other. Plus it has to be independent three ways at a time. So the probability of A times the probability of B times the probability of C is equal to the probability of A and B and C. We won't run up, we won't run across this sort of thing, but I think it's an interesting thing to point out. And it's also easy to point out an example where this is true. Say that you roll, you roll two dice. And first of all, the sum of the two dice is seven. That's one event, right? Anybody know what the probability of that is? Anybody play craps in here? Well, it turns out to be one sixth. Okay. What is the probability that the number of dots on die number one is six? Now, we've learned that this isn't dots. This I should change to pips, right? The number of pips on die number one is six. What's the probability of that happening? One sixth. Yeah, it's one sixth, right? What's the probability of dots on die number two is three, or the number of pips on die number two is three? That's also one sixth, right? So let's look at the pairwise uh, probability. The probability of A and B is equal to the probability of, is it equal to the probability of A and B? So the probability of A and B is a probability of these two things. The sum of the two dice is seven and the number of pips on die one is six. Yeah, that turns out to be appropriately 1 36th. And if you uh, multiply a sixth by a six, you get 1 36th, so that's really good. A and C is the same sort of thing. The probability of A and C, probability of getting the sum of the two dice is seven, and the probability that the dots on die number two is three is equal to 1 36th also. And then finally, uh, B and C, the probability that you have, you have six pips on the first die and three pips on the second die, well, that's, those are independent events in a very classical sense, so that's equal to 1 36th. But what's the probability of all three of them happening at the same time? They will never happen. Because if you have, if you have, if you have, where's my marker here? If you have six, if you have six pips on one die and three pips on the other die, you can never have the sum of the two dice being seven, right? So the probability of all three happening is zero. And in order to be independent, these probabilities have to add to one over 216, which is one over six cubed, I believe. So th this is a simple example of where events can be, in a mathematical sense, independent pairwise, but not independent uh, three at a time. However, most of our applications, most of our applications is going to be to experiments, like rolling a die or, or, or flipping a coin. So we're going to talk about one experiment after another experiment after another experiment after another experiment. And typically when we do these, we say that all of those events are independent of each other, although the mathematics is a little bit more uh, non-forgiving in a general sense. But we won't be applying that general sense very much. 
mutually exclusive. Now, whereas independence occur, uh, refers to things happening one after another, um, mutual exclusivity talks about one experiment. You do one experiment. So you do, remember this uh, Venn diagram. You do, you do one experiment. Uh-oh, what happened to my, oh, there it is. Okay, you do one experiment. And remember, this one experiment, you could have an outcome in A. Well, what happened to my universal set? There it is. It came back when I didn't want it to. Okay, you can have a you can have a universal set and an event A and an event B. And if there's no overlap, A can happen or B can happen, but both can happen at the same time. You can't roll a die and get three pips and six pips at the same time. You have to get one or the other or something else. So um, so that's what mutually exclusive is. Apparently, I, I, I switched screens here too and didn't notice. So again, A and B, and they don't intersect. So the intersection of A and B is equal to zero. And then the probability of A and B, if they're mutually exclusive, is equal to this. Can two sets be both independent and mutually exclusive? They, you know, they, this, is, this is not good because if you look it up in the dictionary, mutually exclusive would probably be a synonym of independent, wouldn't it? In that both are trying to say one has nothing to do with the other. But mathematically, they're very, very different. Yeah, but And it turns out rigorously, uh, you can have independence and mutual exclusivity if one or both of the sets is empty. But that's a very degenerate case. So in general, you can't do that. In general, that doesn't work. OK, now, I, I let's see if I can. No, I don't know how to do that. OK, there's conditional probability. The probability of A given B is equal to the probability of the intersection divided by the probability of B. Uh, and a lot of this we can appeal to by intuition. I won't belabor the point. But the probability of A given B, if A and B are independent, if A and B are dependent, then B tells you nothing about A. And that is just the probability of A. Here's, here's the way I like to think of the probability of A given B. Wow. My pin has gone rogue. Here's the way I like to think about A given B. This is the event A, and this is the event B. The probability of A given B means that you're given B B becomes your universal set now. B becomes your universal set. So the probability of A given B is just this area here. Does that make sense? Again, your universal set becomes B and the probability of A, a probability of A given B means you only have to consider A when it's in the set B. And so that is simply this intersection here. And so that's the good way to think about the conditional probability. And if they're independent, one has nothing to do with the other one, then the probability of A given B is the probability of A. What about if they're mutually exclusive? It's zero, the conditional probability. Yep. It's zero. Yep. Yeah, it's zero because if they are mutually exclusive, then they don't overlap at all, and the probability is zero. So here we have something called a universal set partition. It's where you take a um, it's where you take a set, and you divide it into a bunch of different subsets. And what you want is you want all of the subsets to be independent of each other. So the intersection is equal to the null set. And they are exhaustive in the sense if you take the union of all these sets, you get the, um, you get the universal set. So this is called a partition. What we're going to be talking about now is this universal partition. And somebody comes along and says, OK, within this uni universal partition, I have a value. I know that it's in B. So it's going to be, a, it's going to be given B. So B becomes your new universal set. If you know it's B, you don't have to care about any of these other results because you know that it's in B, right? 
you know that the answer is in B. So all of a sudden, this takes the, this this set B takes on itself the new role of being the universal set. Um, and this leads us to the idea of um, the theorem of total probability, which we can understand from the ben Venn diagram. We're going to try to find the probability of B. So we're going to try the pro the, uh, of this kind of, I don't know what color that, kind of a red splotch. Well, that's equal to the probability of B given A. What's the probability of B given A? If, if, if it's one, that's equal to the that's equal to the intersection, right? And it's the same thing with each each of these different ones, and so therefore we can get the probability of B by adding up all of these areas. And if we add up all three of these areas, we're going to get the probability of B. That's what the theory of total probability says. It's equal to the probability of B given AI times the probability of AI. And you'll notice this is the same thing as the probability of A sub I and B. So if we have an exhaustive partition and we add up all of these smaller subsets, then we are going to get the probability of B. And then by the definition of conditional probability, we can always transform it into this form. This leads us into something called Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem is controversial. Bayes' theorem relates probabilities. Well, usually we think of probabilities as something occurring in the past, right? No, we think of probabilities of something occurring in the future. We roll a die. We want to know what the outcome is in the future. What is it? Checking my time here. Okay, we're good. Uh, so if we roll a die, what are we estimating? We're estimating the probability this occurs in the future. Bayes' theorem generates probabilities by things occurring in the past. And because of that, there's some people that don't like Bayes' theorem. Here is the, here, here is the situation. If we have the probability of A given B, A, A and B, that can be written as a conditional probability either by putting the A first or the B first, right? Both of those are righteous definitions of conditional probability that we could use. So we can then solve for one of the probabilities, the probability that AI given B is equal to this. So this is just a little bit uh, algebraic manipulation of this equation on the top. It's a little algebraic manipulation. So we are good. But here's the problem. Um, here's one way to look at Bayes' theorem. We have a number of urns or canisters. And in these canisters, we have three red balls and uh, one black ball. In here, we have two red balls and two black balls. Here we have um, four red balls and one black ball. Is that okay? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to choose one of the canisters and then we're going to choose a random ball out of that canister. And we can talk about the probability of that ball being red, correct? That, that, that's, a viable, that's a viable solution. The other thing we could do, and this is, this is a result of Bayes' theorem, is we can choose a ball. And let's call this urn A. Let's call this B. And let's call this C. 
we can choose a ball and we can ask if it's red, what's the probability it was chosen from the third urn? Do you get the idea? We've drawn a ball, it's red. What's the probability it came from the third urn or urn number C? Notice we're talking about the probability that that red ball came from an event in the past. It's not a probability about the future, it's the probability about something in the past. So this is, uh, th 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 this is controversial. However, one of the engineering axioms is you cannot argue with a theory if it's reduced to practice successfully. So if it's reduced to practice and everybody is using it, you can't argue with it. So one of the things that we can't argue with is that Bayes' theorem works. In fact, probably your spam filter works this way. For example, you get a, uh, a you get a message. And this is a spam message or A2 is not spam. And we have the probability of A1, the probability that it's that it's spam. Or let me do it this way. We can talk about the probability of spam given an outcome by looking at all of the emails that we get and uh, figuring out what percentage of them are spam and what are not spam. And we would do this normally by looking at some of the features within the email, right? So this is data that we have access to. So we look at a million email messages and uh, we find out that uh, that the probability of a, of a spam is say 10%. So Bayes' theorem, let's see, I got this, I got, I, I got this backwards, I believe. Yeah, this is what we can measure. I'm sorry, I got this backwards. We can measure the probability of the output given that it's spam. So we have these million email messages. Everybody, go, somebody goes through and marks them as spam, not spam, 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 not spam, spam, spam. And then we could use relative frequency in order to figure out what's the probability of, of the outcome given that spam. Would you notice that from this and Bayes' theorem, we can get the probability that it's spam given what the outcome is. So it flips these two things around and we can literally use Bayesian sort of inference to tell us the probability that uh, email messages spam or not. And this is basically the technique that's used in, uh, used in spam filtering. I hope that wasn't too, uh, too ambiguous. So here's Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem flips these things around and uh, it, what, what it's used for is making classifications using a historical database. If you're up with artificial intelligence, you know that neural networks does this, doesn't it? It uses, it uses historical data in order to train the neural network. So then in the future, if you're presented with new data, it can make the corresponding correct classification. So in that sense, neural networks are kind of Bayesian detectors in the sense they use data from the past in order to forecast things in the future. And so that's what, uh, that's, that's what this expression is. Bayes' theorem is a little bit more complicated. You remember the theorem of total probability? Well, no, I don't have the total probability. You remember the total, the theorem of total probability? Where was the th theorem of total probability? Let's see, I had it up here. That the probability of B was equal to the summation, right? If you take probability of B given AI, okay. So if you take that and place it here, in other words, you express this as the probability of uh, B given AI times the 
probability of AI. And you sum this up over all values and you're looking for a specific value of A such as A2. Now that is usually the definition of, of Bayes' theorem. In other words, Bayes' theorem has the summation in the bottom usually for the probability of B. One of the things that we found out, which is um, kind of interesting, is uh, Pascal's um, uh, venture into becoming a Christian last time. This isn't uh, talked about a lot, but Bayes is used all over the place, but it's not lauded a lot that the guy was a, um, he was a pastor. That's what he did for a living. He was a pastor, Presbyterian pastor in a church uh, outside of London. And it, it, he found that, that, shepherding his flock was more important than publishing his mathematics. So he didn't po bother to publish his mathematical work. It was all published posthumously. And people were so impressed that they, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1742, having no published works on mathematics. You try to do that today with the IEEE or the Optical Society of America or other places, other professional societies, which give you a fellow status, and it won't happen. So uh, he, did, he, did, he did publish a lot about his faith. And here's one of his works, Divine uh, Benevolence, where he talks about God. He was, very, he was very big into this idea called of rectitude. Anybody know what rectitude is? I don't really know. But Bayes talked about rectitude a lot. It's like righteousness. It's like what, righteousness? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there are modifications of righteousness. I like righteousness better. I guess he was using the old English. So it's anyway. From, it's what from time? Latin, rectitude is from Latin. Oh, it is. Have you had Latin? Uh, no, from Spanish. When something in English sounds like Spanish is Latin. <laughs> I see, okay, <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, thank you, Glauco. Okay, so that's... Um, so that's it. That is it for these slides. I'm wondering if there's any questions that you might have. No question, but I'm, I'm still stumped on the presidents. Good. It really shows you, believe it or not, that your mind is in a rut. Because if you're like me when I heard the problem, I could not help thinking about, now well, let's see, three out of five, but this guy knew it exactly. Three out of five, but this guy knew it exactly. What the heck is the deal? And you got to quit thinking about three out of five, like my friend who was the missionary in, uh, uh, my friend who was the missionary in, um, in, in Japan did. Okay, well, with that, let's, uh, how much time do we have? We have a few more minutes, if you will. No, we don't. We're at 144. That's, that's time to go. Okay, if there's no questions, and... Um, so was, the, was it four out of the five died on 4th of July or three out of the five? Three out of the five. Okay. All right. But I tell you what, you could ask, you could say that there was, I'll give you a hint, okay, that it was four out of the five, and the answer would still be the same. Adam Glauco, is that right? Could be four out of five, the answer would be the same. It could be two out yeah. of five, the answer would be the same. Okay. Yeah. What? <laughs> uh, you guys, your mind's in a rut, right? And uh, one of the things we want to do is, is get into probability and uh, random variables and stochastic processes here in this class. But this just illustrates that the answer to all life's problems does not lie within mathematics. I'll give you one more hint, okay? The solution is based on a psychological observation. Would you like me to repeat the problem one more time? I think I've got the problem. Oh, you think you got that? No, I'm not sure you do. I'm not sure you, know, you have the, old, the whole problem. Okay. Okay, little boy was riding along. 
guy came on the radio, said, this is astonishing. This is amazing. United States, that this is mind blowing. The United States had, was declared independence on July 4th. And of the first five U.S. presidents, uh, Washington, um, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, three of them died on the 4th of July. And the little kid knew immediately what the answer was. And I will tell you that the answer is not in the part of the presentation of the problem that you're concentrating on. He, he knew all three that died or just one? There's just one. Okay. okay, guys, we'll see you then uh, a week from today. And I'll post the homework on the spreadsheet, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, bye-bye.